Welcome everybody to the Diagnosis webinar about spectral libraries. So today we will cover a number of topics that will help you create optimal spectral libraries and get great results from your DIA experiments. Uh, I have with me uh, Lukas Reiter, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Biognosis, Matija Rojnik, who is the Marketing Manager, and my name is Stefan. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Biognosis. We'll walk you through a presentation on the various topics, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Um, you can uh, ask questions using the Q&A function on the right-hand side, and we'll share a recording of this webinar with you so that you can watch it again or share with a colleague. And of course, if you have any further questions, please do contact us at info at biognosis.ch and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. So let's get started. So why are spectral libraries important? Um, more and more people start to use data independent acquisition strategies. And uh, here all peptides are systematically fragmented using wide mass isolation windows. So the precursor range selection is typically wider than in other methods, for example in DDA, and this results in highly convoluted uh, fragment ion spectra. So the most commonly used DIA workflows uh, rely on spectral libraries, and these spectral libraries are used to deconvolute the spectra that you get when you acquire in DIA mode. So in a nutshell, a good spectral library means higher number of IDs and lower CVs, so overall better results from your experiment. So what is a spectral library? Uh, we define a spectral library as a non-redundant collection of high-quality peptide assays, or MSMS spectra, that serve as a template for peptide identification in DIA-targeted analysis. The analysis of DIA data requires precise knowledge of the peptide fragmentation and the chromatographic coordinates. So a spectral library usually contains information on precursors, on selected fragment ions and its intensities, and a standardized retention time. So if we take a look at how spectral libraries are generated, then we see that typically spectral libraries are generated by performing shotgun proteomics on the sample type of interest. These DDA runs are then searched with a database search engine to identify the peptides in the MSMS spectrum, and the search results are condensed into a spectral library. Now on the right-hand side, you see a screenshot of Biognosis Spectronaut software. Uh, Spectronaut allows uh, you to easily create spectral libraries with a few clicks, but we'll come back to that later. So one question that we, we get asked frequently is, is you know, what is better, a sample-specific library or a large public library? Now, in our view, better means that you're getting better results out of your subsequent DIA experiments, so a higher number of ID uh, proteins, lower CVs, higher reproducibility, etc. So from that perspective, um, let's take a look at an, a very interesting systematic comparison that um, Jan Muntel and Hanno Steen did from the Boston's Children's Hospital. They compared the results they got with different libraries in terms of overall protein and peptide identification and their reproducibility. So the samples they used in this experiment were urine samples. This was part of a urine biomarker study. And I encourage you to, to read the, the full papers. They're uh, really very interesting. So uh, the data was acquired on three technical replicates per sample. And um, the same set of urine samples were, uh, were acquired first on a, a Thermo Fisher Q executive and then on a, a SIEX uh, triple top to create libraries number one and two. Library number three is a combination of the data from library one and two. And library five is a publicly available comprehensive human swath library, so a repository of essays to quantify uh, over 14,000 human proteins by swath MS. Library four then is the subset of proteins that were found in library three and five together. So what we can see on the right-hand panels is that library three and not library 5, yields the best results in terms of peptide and protein IDs with a high reproducibility. So here we can clearly see the advantage of a sample-specific library and, and that larger is not necessarily better. 
Uh, but there are in fact cases where a large public data set helps you get better results. So this is an in-house experiment where we used public DDA data from the laboratory of Matthias Mann. Uh, and we, we took 270 runs that were done on a Q-executive and created, um, created our own spectral library from these runs. Um, then we went on and analyzed um, mouse brain samples in-house <clears throat> uh, with a four-hour DIA run on our own Q-executive HF. Uh, and we identified uh, over 8,000 proteins. So that is a, a very good result. Um, so with a, the with a spectral library from the usual workflow, we, we identified <clears throat> a little over 7,000 proteins. Now, having said that, that, there are some requirements. So uh, if you want to do this type of experiment, it has to be on same or very similar tissue. Uh, you need your LCMSMS setup to be almost exactly the same in terms of chromatography, instrument gradient. Um, you need high quality DDA data and of course if you want to create a, a spectral library from that many runs uh, you need a signif significant amount of computational resources. Um, so, so that then, if you add all of that up, that pushes you from 7,000 to about 8,000 IDs. Um, so, so the time investment is huge. So the question is then, is that proportional to the results obtained uh, or, or, or are you okay with the slightly fewer uh, ideas that you're there getting? So <clears throat> one aspect in, in uh, <clears throat> spectral library creation is of course uh, how you select the samples for, for the library creation. So um, for a spectral library to have the broadest cover coverage, we suggest to have separate DDA runs of the distinctive samples so that you get the most heterogeneous representation. So um, what we try to do in-house when we make spectral libraries, we try to generate them with maximum six DDA runs or six injections. So for example, here, if, if the experiment uh, you are doing you have uh, six healthy individuals and six uh, sick individuals. A scheme that would say, uh, make sense is to pull all the healthy and pull all the sick separately and measure three technical replicates of each pool. That, for example, makes more sense than pooling everything and measuring six uh, technical replicates of that. So if, for example, there are three instead of two conditions, it could make sense then to measure two replicates of the respective condition pools, again, to have six uh, injections. Another uh, important question that we also get asked a lot is, is you know, should we fractionate or, or, or not fractionate our samples? Um, so what, what is better, um, you know, to create a spectral library from fractionated samples or from unfractionated samples? And to be clear, the question is not whether the DIA experiment should be done with fractionated samples, but whether the spectral library should be created with, um, with fractionated samples. So uh, we, we conducted a study in-house to explore the differences in, in performance of spectral libraries and we used two strategies. So the first one was we went ahead and we did six, six technical replicates uh, of, of, uh, of DDA runs as we described before. And the second approach was we uh, fractionated the samples using high pH reverse phase fractionation and we fractionated the sample into six fractions. So <clears throat> the samples in this case was uh, HeLa cell culture um, and we, uh, we ran out all the samples separately in DDA uh, and, and basically used six pools. And um, uh, in the case of the fractionation approach, we made a pool of all of our samples and we fractionated it. So then what we, uh, what we found, <clears throat> what we found was <clears throat> uh, that, the, um, that the spectral library based on fractionation uh, was, was much larger both in terms of precursor IDs and, and protein IDs. And then we went on to, um, to compare this, um, these, these spectral libraries against each other in an actual uh, DIA experiment. And uh, what we can see here um, is that the, the DIA runs yielded more protein IDs uh, on average and better reproducibility when using the fractionated library. Now, again, to point out that DIA measurements are done without prefractionation, so in a single, single shot uh, experiment. So the downside of, of this, uh, of course, is that 
the sample fractionation adds some overhead to the sample prep, but this experiment clearly shows that uh, you get a higher number of average protein IDs, the reproducibility is, is better and you get lower uh, CVEs. So in the next section, we want to focus on the role of accurate retention time uh, normalization. So the question then is, why is it important to have accurately predicted retention times in spectral libraries? Um, so the, the expected elution time in the spectral library limits the XICs to a specific window where the peptide is expected to elute. And the more accurate the elution time, uh, the smaller the window. And the smaller the window, the faster the data processing. And in addition, the higher the specificity and sensitivity because signals outside the window are, are blinded out and you have no interfering signals. Um, but the retention times are not comparable on an absolute scale, especially if you have uh, heterogeneous measurements uh, combined into a single library. So there is a need for a dimensionless solution, uh, here the IRT. So the IRT concept allows precise prediction of peptide retention time on any chromatographic system. And this IRT scale was initially developed for the simple scheduling in, in SRM essays, but it works uh, uh, well in HRM essays as well. So uh, Biognosis actually offers um, uh, IRT and HRM calibration kits based on this concept, so please do take a look at our website uh, if you want more information on it. So um, the, the IRT's linear model over the whole gradient does not consider local fluctuations on nonlinear gradients. And so we've upgraded that uh, IRT concept into what we call high precision IRT. So what we did was we extended the set of the original 11 IRT peptides to two thousands of fixed anchor points derived from the sample. And these uh, peptide anchor points are now stored in Spectronaut. So to generate a high precision model, Spectronaut takes the peptides that are available in each specific sample for library generation. So the base of this uh, concept is still the IRT scale and of course for the actual runs uh, in DIA mode uh, with your actual samples where Spectronaut uses the IRT peptides for calibration and quality control, it still uh, makes sense to include the IRT peptides in the sample. So we, we went on and, and tried to quantify the effect of high precision IRT versus sort of the, the, the linear IRT. We designed an experiment where uh, we, we, we simulated imprecise uh, IRT values by adding normally distributed IRT noise to the reference, high precision IRT spectral library. So that's on the left panel. And these spectral libraries were then used for the targeted analysis of DIA, DIA data from HeLa cell digests. And then we looked at the number of average IDs on a peptide level. Uh, so what you can see is that the, the high precision IRT library results in about 25% more IDs as compared to no IRT and about 15% more IDs as compared to the classical IRT uh, concept. So, so a clear improvement. So as part of the, the same um, investigation, we looked at which experimental factors uh, influence retention time precision. And uh, we, we changed nine uh, relevant experimental factors like mobile phase, gradient length, etc. And, and we looked at the effect uh, on the IRT, uh, IRTs uh, by looking at uh, extremes within, within one factor. And basically um, the conclusion from this is that the IRT values are generally transferable across a wide range of experimental windows uh, or experimental conditions. However, the best results are achieved if the library generation and the analytical measurements are performed on the same system. Uh, so, so not surprisingly, we could see here that mobile phase, uh, mobile phase acid and gradient length have the largest influence uh, on the IRT transferability. So looking at the, um, the computational challenges in spectral library generation, we find that until recently it was uh, a rather complicated process with <clears throat> with uh, with the experts having uh, each expert having its own workflow essentially based on a lot of manual work and and this um, this these hurdles if you will to to library generation discouraged many people from going into SWATH or, or DIA in the first place 
Um, so the, the spectral library generation involves a lot of st steps that one needs to get right. And, uh, and there's really multiple strategies and workflows available. And they usually require uh, a, a, a decent amount of uh, expert knowledge. So only recently have we seen software developments that are showing the way into full automation of this. So one example of this is the, the Spectronaut software developed by Biognosis. So it's, um, it's a dedicated uh, software developed for the analysis of DA data sets. And it's, um, it contains an easy to use model module for, for spectral library generation. So basically with a few clicks you can set up your spectral library. Um, and as mentioned uh, earlier, the high precision RT uh, concept and mass calibration are, are included. So if we take a look which steps are supported by, by Spectronaut, then we have the, the database search. So Spectronaut works with the main Proteomics platform. So we have uh, MaxQuant, Proteome Discover, and the next release will also support uh, Protein Pilot. And then we have the actual um, uh, spectral library generation. So where the, the search engine output is parsed into the Spectronaut format, um, then the uh, most uh, intense uh, peptide spectrum matches are identified for each precursor and the MS2 spectra is annotated with the fragment ions. Uh, then there's a re regression for each of the run, uh, and there's uh, uh, IRTs that are uh, <clears throat> assigned. And then the precursor ions across all DDA runs are summarized based on median IRT in the consensus MS2 spectra, and then the protein interference uh, correction is, is performed. And finally, the, the library is, is generated. So, um, with the library generation module of, uh, of Spectronaut, this happens with, with a few clicks. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that spectral libraries play an important role in targeted analysis of DIA data, and uh, generating sample-specific libraries is still the preferred workflow, although in very specific cases you can see public libraries can give you uh, good or better results. Um, sample fractionation is a good strategy for creating better libraries, uh, but you have to be willing to uh, accept the overhead in, in, in sample preparation. So the precise retention time normalization leads to more IDs and a better reproducibility in the DIA experiment. And, uh, and com the combination of Spectronaut with one of the supported search engines is a very easy workflow for spectral library generation. So <clears throat> this concludes our presentation. Thank you for your attention and we'll open the floor for questions now. Uh, and of course, feel free to um, get in touch with us anytime at biognosis, uh, info at biognosis.ch.